Well, gentlemen, it's a pleasure to see you all here at Mobile World Congress on the Red Hat stand. I think we're going to have an interesting discussion about the transition to cloud native and what that's going to mean for operators and the industry as it goes forward. But uh, to start with, maybe we can go down the line and do some introductions. Yeah. I'm Mark Longwell, Director of Telco and Edge Alliances at Red Hat. I focus mostly on enabling partners on the Red Hat platforms, mainly OpenShift and OpenStack. And Alex? Hi, uh, Alex Boyd. I'm Head of Telco Cloud at Virgin Media 02, which is a joint venture between Liberty Global and Telefonica in the UK. Um, we run, I run the mobile core hosting functions, so anything that the O2 brand network runs across in core networks, that's us, so looking after the cloud native platforms, the VNF platforms, CNF platforms, those kind of things, so yeah, anything in, in there for that, that's my role. Great, thanks Alex. Uh, so I'm Andy Douglas. Uh, I run our global telco vertical at Pure Storage. I've uh, been there for around about two years now. What that really means is, is, uh, is how we work with our, uh, our ever-growing global uh, telco presence across, across all our key customers. We also look at solutions, what kind of solutions are required to be relevant in the industry, developing new use cases, specifically working with, uh, with partners uh, like Red Hat and many, many others. Um, and yeah, you know, really focusing on what the, 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 the trends are in the market and what we need to do to stay up as an as organization in that space. Well, so let's maybe take a look back. You know, containerization, cloud native, these are not new buzzwords, particularly not here at Mobile World Congress, but um, you know, the transition to cloud native, it's been maybe a little slower than we would have predicted a few years back. So uh, I'd be curious to hear some perspective on, if you think about the last five years, what have you learned that might be applicable to the next five years? I mean, Alex, let's start with you. I think it's, if you don't prepare, to get to the, to the transition, like, don't start now. Where do you want to be in five years' time? You need to lay the foundations now. And that's kind of what we learned coming out of the back of, um, sort of the NFVI and VNF transition, if you like, was the, the CNF workloads have crept up on us. They're suddenly here and they're, and they're in the middle of it. We started to prepare two or three years ago for that transition to a, to a more uh, modern uh, Kubernetes platform. And, and that's where we are. So it's, it's about getting started and looking forward and mm -hmm. setting yourself a target and going towards it. Like. That's what we see. We also see our application uh, vendors starting to mature into that space a bit more. Right? So, so some of the offerings were, they were just uh, ports of the same thing all the time, right? And now we're right in that space where they're actually coming up with and, and embracing the Kubernetes environment and the orchestration mm -hmm. and all the tools and, and the, the options, I say, the innovation that's available there as well. So that's what we see. Andy, what's your perspective there? Yeah, no, <clears throat> I think just uh, from what Alex was saying, I mean, I think for I think for me, if you if you look at the transformation in the container space, it's a whole new world, right? You know, you know, containerization has obviously been around for for a while, but you know, emer even still now, emerging technologies uh, in regards to Kubernetes, specifically around the enterprise, right? But you look what we've done in for many many years in telcos in the IT cloud space with the advent of virtualization you know, modernizing the cloud, the hyper cloud experience. It's all been centered on around having a enterprise grade support structure, i.e. reliability, security, uh, recoverability, and all those, all those different things. I think that's, you know, something that we've had to build into our products, something that we've had to work on with the likes of, you know, with, uh, with Red Hat. Uh, and why we're in that space is, how can you provide that, that edge of, enterprise grade robustness in a very, very sensitive place, right? The network is a very, very sensitive place in terms of its importance, its applications, you know, the, the, the requirements, the, you know, the, the latency required, et cetera, performance. Um, so certainly, as Alex said, you've got to have that plan uh, and you've got to start to think about how I deliver things now in a, in a much more robust, secure way. Yeah. What's yeah. I mean, the view from Red Hat. I know you yeah. all have some broad experience managing hybrid cloud, yeah. but uh, you know what? Uh, what do you? Uh, what'd you learn over the past five years? You well, think? CNFs is right in my wheelhouse because I run the CNF certification program at Red Hat. So when we started five years ago, as Alex said, you saw virtual machines just in a wrapper. They weren't containerized. They weren't cloud serviceable or cloud architecture. And over the last five years, we've seen more and more move to cloud-based architectures and so forth and become true cloud-native cloud, cloud -native telco functions. Um, you know, all of our partners, whether it's Pure slash Portworks or the Ericsson's and so forth of the world, they're moving more towards you know, cloud-based, leveraging CNF, CF, CNCF best practices and so on and so forth. So we're seeing a maturity of the market. 
well, if I can stay with you, Mark, you know, mm -hmm. let's let's look ahead now for your customers that have kind of successfully built that cloud foundation. Right. What can they do that benefits the business? What can they do that benefits their customers? Well, that's a three and 5G rollout, I would say, at scale now. We're seeing the ability for them to slice a network up and provide a certain service on that slice with ultra low latency, which obviously is good for the customer. It provides services to the telco and additional revenue streams. So we're seeing capabilities that are starting to mature also. 5G slow out was probably a little slow, but it is picking up, and I think our service provider customers are seeing that also. Yeah, and I mean, Alex, I know the big goals are save money, make money, but I, I mean, specifically to the to the services that you're providing, what's a priority? Uh, I think the priority is, as, as you mentioned, actually opening up those APIs into those services is one of the key things that's going to enable new revenue streams for us, right? or the, uh, the potential new revenue streams. Um, you mentioned working as partnership. I think that's something else we've got to look at, is um, making sure that, that I you know, and my business posture the same way that you guys do. So these back-to-back -back certification processes, making sure I work with all of our partners, establishing ways and methods of practice to bring that all to life on, on the flip mm -hmm. side, in, inside my business, the same as it is on the outside. You mentioned you know, some of the, the larger NEPs as well, making sure we all look very familiar wherever we go. Right? That's what's key for us. But yeah, definitely, we see a lot of that um, uh, network slicing, networks as a service, private 5G, those kind of things are, are coming to the fore now. They've been talking about them probably for too long. Yeah. And now we're starting to put the the, uh, our money where our mouth is, if you like. And just, just with that very quickly, if you don't mind me asking a quick question, you know, with, with network slicing has been around for a long time, right? I, mean, I remember talking about network slicing or, or listening to the organizations many, many years ago. It seems to now to be getting traction. It seems to now be, what, 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 why is that? Why is it, why, why now? Mostly, uh, just pointed the this rollout of standalone 5G. Right. You know, we've got to the point of maturity with our 5G <laughs> solutions. Right? So now we can actually go. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we did open heart surgery on our network over the last three to five years. We replaced everything from one end to the other. So that's done effectively. Mm -hmm. We've got those platforms and now we can actually leverage the, 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 the capabilities that are in there. That's, that's why. Yeah, 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 sure, makes sense. It opens yeah. it up for us. Yeah. Andy, anything you'd add yeah, there? Yeah, I mean, just, I guess just briefly, you know, from, from, from ourselves, and one thing that we've, we've, we've noted uh, is that you are really now working across a multitude of different providers. Um, and that's where you know our one of our products, Portworks, really comes into its in its own really because of the ability to to work across any any platform and provide uh, you know Kubernetes based storage. Uh, and, uh, and the reason why I say that, rather than just trying to sound like I'm uh, advertising one of my products, is is more around because of that ecosystem's large, right? You know, v vendors are um, you know looking to towards. Um, sorry, customers looking towards to put some of their workloads in the cloud. You know, is it is it a possibility that some some five G elements can be run in a you know in a, in a cloud like service, and that's maybe not it's been as successful on on the hyperscale as before. You've got multiple different vendors from different uh, you know kind of legacy providers. Um, so I, I actually think whilst we talked about you know multi cloud and hybrid cloud in the IT cloud world. Actually, it's now actually also relevant in the network. There are, you know, it, it really is a wider ecosystem, right? And potentially a wide ecosystem of different landing zones. And all of that means you've got to control your data better. You've got, you've got to really, really focus on where that data is. How am I going to maximize it? How am I going to, you know, data management? How am I going to pool that data? Because um, I'm sure we'll talk about AI in a minute because it comes, becomes really important when you get onto that topic. Yeah, so I, I did want to talk a little bit about um, automation. You know, I, I've had a lot of conversations with operators and, and vendors around the FIRA, and it feels like we're at this point in time where there's a lot of success in point solutions for automation. So now it's about tying those together into a system solution. So, I, you know, a tricky thing to do, but it's going to be imperative to manage complexity and manage cost. But I'd like to get some perspective from each of you on, you know, how do you how do you do the nuts and bolts work of going from sort of a open loop to a closed loop? Uh, Mark? Yeah, I threw, basically right at we have Ansible automation platform, which is one of our tools, which leads to automation of the network and so forth. And just to dip the toes into AI for a minute, you know, AI is a broad subject. So how do you slice it into something serviceable and manageable? So things like autonomous networks. How do you make them autonomous? You ingest AI, you use things like Ansible, you use other tools to make that network learn on its own, heal on its own, reboot itself, and take care of itself, and take the human experience possibly out of it, reducing costs. So it's, it's multiple ways to get to a solution, and they're, quite frankly, not the same at every customer, right? It's based on the environment and so on and so forth. They are unique, but through some of the tools we have and partner tools, 
you know, we're working to our partners to create you know, automated solutions. Yeah. Alex, what's the view from uh, VMO2 Telefonica? And I'm also curious if you can kind of highlight how it's changed the engineering organization. Yeah, definitely. Um, so what we've seen, as I said, we've been doing all this work over the last three to five years. It's been very engineer heavy. Even when you're, I see, point solution for automated, you automate parts of it. I can now do things in an automated fashion, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't go end to end. So what we did three years ago was we introduced uh, a specific dedicated automation team to bring this to life for us so they can actually, as you say, go from sort of open loop to closed loop. That's exactly what we're trying to do. How do you go take the state of an application on infrastructure, marry those two things together, call that a system, and then, as you said, make changes to it, add, grow, remove, right? That's where we want to start to look at it. So we're, we've, we're up with the, uh, where we are currently, we're just about to, to start that kind of, from the ground up, let's go and build for fully automated end to end, right? So it enables us to take away a lot of that lifecycle management effort. Um, if we don't do that, the costs don't disappear, mm -hmm. right? So you don't get the benefits of these things. So again, it's not about looking forward and go, where do you want to be? We want to be lower cost to serve. We've got to make changes. We've got to get this stuff right. So we start now. It'll be probably slightly painful on, you know, in the first instances. We'll make some small gains and then we'll make big gains later on. So mm -hmm. that's, that, that's where we're at with that, right? And uh, you know, Andy, you kind of raised this point. Maybe you can expand on it. But you know, your goal is automation, and to do that, you've got to have a data strategy and a, a data platform in place. Otherwise, you're not going to make much headway. But you know, what are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, for sure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's uh, it's a really you know really interesting topic. I, I mean, we automation is key, right? You know, automation with key working with the likes of you mentioned before Ansible, Terraform. You know, making it uh, making our you know making the systems as as recoverable as possible, you know. There's uh, there's a constant swathe of, you know, uh, uh, changes and uh, updates and how do you kind of manage the, especially that complex ecosystem I mentioned before. You know, you might have multiple different stacks of different providers at different levels with the likes of kind of Red Hat orchestrated in between. Some port, very very complicated, right? So you, it's, the automation is absolutely key. The other thing I would say is, uh, and to, to answer your question, is that, you know. Uh, you know, a, a lot of telcos, they're, they're still, they're, they're, they're buying ways are still what they did maybe 10 years ago, uh, which is very much a procurement heavy activity, right? And uh, listen, everybody understands that because, you know, data, storage, even, you know, compute to a point is a, a kind of commodity or deemed a commodity set of uh, 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 hardware and architectures. However, you're now placing that commodity really at the kind of the, the center of what your future strategy is which is data and if you've not if you're not able to to have an effective data management strategy across various different components of, of the telco all the way from the BSS to the OSS to the edge you know where you're now feeding new applications at the edge you're you know all, all the big providers here today right you know um, are all talking about this vertical stacks appearing at the near edge and you know, uh, more smart uh, applications, um, you know, making more, you know, uh, autonomous decisions on the network, that's got to be fed by data. And, and I think that will, that will be an area, I believe, a focus that will, will, will be doubled down for the, you know, for the, for the industry. Yeah, and Andy and I were talking to before this that, you know, data is the new oil, yeah. right? So the ways to ingest it, digest it, get data out of your data to act on, is really the key component to make these networks autonomous and effective and reduce human costs, reduce total costs basically, right? So we're all working together for the same goal. Yeah, and you know, we're at the end of day three here at the Congress, <laughs> so I thought maybe it'd be a good time to reflect on what we've learned, what we haven't learned perhaps, but uh, you know, the key theme, it's AI. I mean, right. that's, that's kind of obvious to everybody. I guess what's come up in my conversations is there's a lot of pressure from the board level. There's a lot of pressure from the C-suite to start showing ROI for any kind of AI investment. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, as you try to do that, might shine some lights on some other problems, whether that's data strategy, whether that's cloud strategy, or even you know need to modernize some of your IT estate. But I'd be really interested to get some uh, observations from you all about what you've learned at the show. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably I'll probably start. So I've, I guess I've learned sort of two core things. Number one is get a better set of trainers. I've done sixteen thousand <laughs> steps per hour, so uh, I need to I need to develop that for my next my next visit. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, yeah, I mean, we touched on some of the points a moment ago, so I won't labor them, but you know, AI, is, AI is key. 
um, it, it's part of everyone's strategy. But the, the, I, I still think the irony in AI, you know, in some ways is, is that everything we've been looking to do the last couple of years in the IT industry as a whole, but specifically the telco industry is about densification, is around, you know, uh, ESG at the heart of everything. Uh, it's around, you know, looking to, to do more for less. Well, all those things are the kind of the counter opposite in some ways when you're employing an AI strategy because you need more infrastructure, you need more power, uh, you certainly need, uh, you know, uh, um, a, a, certainly a level of funding to be able to support that. So I, I think, and I'm interested to see what Alex said about this, but I, I think you'll start to see smaller deployments of kind of AI language models in various different areas because I think the reality is is that the there's only a few companies in the world that can actually produce the size footprints that you know are kind of required for the large language modules. Modules, it's it's such an investment. Um, but I, it, it's not it's not it's coming. It's definitely here. But there's a lot more thought to I think to go to go into it. Alex. I would I absolutely agree with that. <coughs> it's the um, we see that things like very specific small language models, if you want to call them that, right? That we would be able to run ourselves, yeah. plug into key systems. Uh, you know, we're going to be looking at broadly 5G and the RAN spaces, right? First, because they're, they're going to be the big things. Um, steering traffic around, making decision points. You know, uh, moving some of that, that intelligence out to the edge. That's what we're trying to look at in that space. Um, yeah, the large language stuff is going to be something you're going to buy in, right, <coughs> at that point. So yeah, I, I would concur with the point mm. there. That's, and and, and it, it is difficult to know where to get started always. But again, if you don't prepare, I think we're going to be... So we've, we, we have been looking internally, you know, getting industry views and making sure we've walked around to see what that looks like and feels like. Um, uh, so that's, that's the most important thing is to actually prepare for what's going to come next. As you say, the pressure from the C-suite will, will arrive if we're not ready for it. It'll go somewhere else, right? It won't be us that's doing it. So. Yeah, you know, I think we'll echo some of the uh, the comments here about smaller language models. You know, when ChatGPT comes out, it's this massive LLM. It's great for putting in some Gen AI stuff, but is it practical to run a human resource organization or a customer service organization? What we've been working on at Red Hat is a, an open source project called Instruct Lab through, with IBM, which allows you to take a smaller LLM, train it on your specific material, your specific expertise, and use that model internally, and that require massive amounts of GPUs and infrastructure that is, for most companies, cost prohibitive, or if you can even get the GPUs from a supply chain side, right? So we see smaller models being the way to move forward. I think we all, send, you know, same sentiments right across the board, pretty soon. Yeah, well, uh, gentlemen, it's really good to catch up with you. I appreciate you taking the time to have this conversation with me. Andy, I hope you find those trainers. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm working on it. You know, enjoy the last day of the show. <laughs> all right. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you very much. much.